Um, what we're going to do is we're going to send around um, some wool. And this is an opportunity for you to, to meet other people. In each bag, there's two pieces of wool, so you need to share one each. This is called social networking, you see. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so please do take a bag and share one piece of wool each uh, with everyone in the room. And we'll be using those in about 10 minutes. So thanks so much. Thanks. So one, one small bag in there, that's two pieces of wool. Yes, that's right. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Well, my, my name's Steve, and I'm a knitter. Uh, I'm not a very good knitter. I've just started. And um, what I, I started doing is, is, is I'm going to tell the story of, sort of how I got to this point today. Um, the official title is much longer than just knitting. It's about how can knitting develop program skills in schools, programming skills in schools. And I, I work with many schools and, and many children, many teachers, and some of them are fantastic programmers. They've had an experience in programming. Some people have not really started at all. And in some ways, thinking about doing programming scares them a little bit. So what's it like in schools at the moment? Well, there's a changing world of technology. Uh, new technology is coming along all the time. The children are using new technology at home. Uh, and they're using more and more different types of pad, iPads and other tablets. Um, but in schools, we're, we're sort of struggling to keep up quite often with the technology changing. Uh, I'll give this as an example. In my car, I still have a cassette deck. And my son, who is uh, four, I had to explain to him how he couldn't just like, you know, go to another track easily, how he couldn't sort of flip from one thing to the other. And he said, well, which way do you put it round? And so I've had to explain to him a whole new technology. And some of you will know explaining records to other people. Uh, quite often we do that. So the technology is changing rapidly. Um, but then when the, they talk to the kids about what they know about computing, this is uh, when I nipped into Smith's. And you can see in Smith's under the title computing is things like how to use your Mac, how to use your BlackBerry, things like this. OK, so iPad and iPhone. So let's think about this is to do with computing and PC leisure as well. So if you like some PC leisure. Um, from MIT in America, um, this is a quote here, that um, you want children to get used to digital technology. You want them to start a relationship early. And again, you've seen children, uh, again, my own, using iPads and things like this, where they have no fear. They'll just click away, and in they go. And you want them to also be able to use that technology to express themselves. So this is, again, how we're thinking about the, the title of, of Mitch's title there is Director of Lifelong kindergarten group. So we're trying to think of how can we develop this idea of this computational thinking and learning how to program and things like this from an early age all the way through up to university or into their jobs as they go. And recently, we've had the, the Raspberry Pi, which has caused um, you know, a, a ripple of interest with different people. Uh, quite often, it's people who remember the, the BBC Micro when they were younger and think, oh, this will be great. We can do programming with the kids. But again, within schools, there's some experts, and there's some people very keen on this. And then there's other teachers who have got no experience at all of this. So again, we're trying to think, how can we develop this continuum of uh, learning about programming all the way through? The, the next gen report from Nesta talks about how we need to develop our young children to become the next generation of video uh, game developers and visual uh, design artists and things like this, and how we need to start young, how we need to get them early and get them hooked. In school at the minute, things like the B butter use, that's a floor robot, which goes long using things like logo type programming, so forward one, forward two, turn right 90, things like that are used in schools. And that also links to things like apps, where, again, the children can play games. There's things like where they use um, programming software. So this is an example of where they um, <laughs> programming a drinks machine and things like the logic involved in that. So it's introducing this idea of steps, of logic, of this step first and this step next, and it develops on like that. So that's some examples in school, but not many. So click this one. Um, things like uh, an example here of, of code clubs, where people are trying to encourage schools to start up clubs to introduce the idea of programming. Um, and they're using programs like Scratch. So again, Scratch has come from MIT in America and is, uh, is quite popular in primary schools, but also into lower secondary schools. And it involves things like bits of jigsaw that you can put together in a basic type logo program. So it involves things like loops, uh, things like where you can put in a, a pause or a wait, the idea of key presses. and this then means that kids can start to make their own games. You can use this to program games. And a lot of games we see are the type of retro games, up sort of the Space Invaders and the Pac-Man life sort of thing. OK, so using that, there's a, a scratch curriculums being put together. So things like well, it's not just introducing how to program, but thinking about debugging. How do you fix the problems in there? So in there, for example, here is when you press the key, it says turn right 94 times. What's the problem with my game? And getting the kids to solve those. 
You can also link the Scratch to connect the camera, though, the Xbox Connect camera, so you can have, for example, the children standing in front of the camera and moving around and then actually creating their own actions that come from that. So again, it's sort of stepping into using technology in a very flexible way. And the last example we'll give is, is apps for goods, where the, the children enter a type of dragon's den in secondary school, and in the secondary school, they, they propose an app they'd like to develop, they develop that app, and then they present it back to local companies and businesses. So there's, there's opportunities in pockets of stuff going on through schools. And finally, the, the Computing at School group, uh, CAS, uh, they've put together a curriculum framework where it's trying to talk about why should we start in early years, going all the way through th to higher education. So there's people proposing things of how we can do that. So, you say this, well, what's this to do with knitting? Well, this is my Uncle Norman. Now, my Uncle Norman is a very interesting chap. He uh, lived up in Aberdeen, and he started working for the Inland Revenue. And he went around all of the islands, and he learned how to speak Gaelic. He learned all the different songs. He learned how to weave. He learned how to knit. And he still now comes back, and he sort of does uh, shows, and he does uh, singing. He's good mates with Billy Connolly. Um, but he talked to me about his jumper, and his jumper had different patterns in there. And he says, oh, this was this pattern, and this means this. This is the marriage one, because it goes up and down, up and down all the time. And all these different examples in there. And it's linked back to fishermen's gansies. So again, a bit like a football strip, different fishing villages had a different pattern. So again, in, in the story goes that if, for example, a, a fisherman had gone over, overboard and they found the body, they could work out where he'd come from. Okay. See, now knitting is becoming more popular. So with the Olympics, you can knit your own characters. Okay, so different characters from uh, through the Olympic history, D David Wilkie, right up to Usain Bolt. Okay, and you see that book's available. You know, you can, it's called Knit Olympics. It even has knit your own ticket, which could have solved a lot of problems during the early stages of the Olympic Games. But um, it's becoming more popular. There are some things for children, first knitting, um, this magazine made me laugh in the shop, so I took a photograph of it, of So Hip. Um, but there's lots of magazines, so it is gaining popularity in terms of knitting in, in the public, uh, public eye. Now, in the Northeast, we've got a group, which is a group of people come together. They knit different things. They're trying to involve schools, but at the moment, it's still more adults knitting together. And again, there's a number of groups you can join. You can join Stitch and Bitch, if you like, where there's groups there coming together, even the crews. Unfortunately, you've missed this year's crews to go and join together and think. And this is because the knitting side is very social, that people coming together, talking while knitting. And I thought, well, that's really good for the kids if they could develop these types of social skills too. It's also appearing in popular culture, things like different adverts, where it's using knitting as an example, or just appearing in there. So we're seeing more and more examples in, in everyday life again. So in some ways, it was an old skill which was starting to sort of seem to be dwindling, but actually it's coming more back into popularity. And finally, yarn bombing. It's a form of graffiti knitting. It happens overnight. People turn up and knit things and put them on things. So for example, there's a telephone box in London which got hit uh, one night uh, not so long ago. So I tried to learn to knit. And I got pictures, and I started trying out. I had the knitting needles, and I, I started going looking at the pictures. And I couldn't really do it. Because I couldn't understand the pictures. They were just too hard for me. And I thought, well, how's that work there? And I was like a typical boy who was really sort of, you know, like sort of trying to do it. And I found it difficult. So I thought about what else I was doing in school. And at the time, and, and I still am doing lots of work with games in schools. And the children play the games, and they're, they're very resilient. They'll try and they'll try and they'll try and try again. I thought, well, that's the resilience you need for knitting. It's not an easy thing to do where you might see a lot of craft things where you glue stuff together and it's made. Knitting takes time to learn, takes perseverance and practice. So this is an example of a, a young lad who he, uh, is an 11-year-old in a special school. Well, I've got friends. these blackbirds, and they boom up, kind of. So what I'm going to do for my first shot is I'm going to try and aim for the duck so I can like, try and get a golden egg. And then I'm just going to go for these pigs, really. Okay, so he's explained his strategy. This is what he's going to try and do. His first bird. Yeah, first shot. 
Now the second shot, I'm going to try and go over here so I can get that and so it bombs up. Oh. So he explained his strategy, but actually I'll in the execution again. of it, it didn't work as he wanted it to. Oh, yeah. So he's nearly cleared it, and if you know, if you don't know Angry Birds, there's still a green pig at the bottom he has to explode. So what he does is he goes back, and this video goes on for ages, because he tries, and he tries, and he tries again. And he doesn't get bored, he keeps going, he keeps trying and trying. It's not easy, it may not be even be enjoyable, but he keeps doing it because he wants to succeed. And this sort of idea is the idea of, of flow in video games, where it's, not, it, it's challenging, but it's achievable, it's not too unobtainable. Whereas if it's far too difficult, you get bored and you give up. Or if it's too easy, you get bored too, because it's not going to, you find it too easy. So getting that flow right. A lot of video games have the idea of how it is just challenging enough each time, and you move on. And I thought, well, this is just like knitting. So I looked, where can I get help? And I thought, well, where do all the kids look? They look on YouTube. So you look on YouTube, and actually there's hundreds and hundreds of videos about how to learn to knit on YouTube. Different companies, which I guess helps them sell uh, yarn as well, is they actually have individual like on. videos Insert on how to do Insert the right needle bits. into the bottom of the loop on the left needle. Pull the working yarn over from back to front. Lift the left loop over the right. Be sure. And the beauty is, I can watch that. I can watch it again and again and again, and not be annoying to somebody else. I can watch it in my own pace. I can watch it whenever I want. So that watching a video is useful, but I also thought, well, if the kids can be making their own videos to remind themselves how to do it, then this is another good technological skill which they'll be developing. There's different apps they could use too there, and also what I came across, which was a big breakthrough for me, was the craft club. Now, in, across the country, yeah, the craft council is trying to set up craft clubs in schools, getting people who can knit and do other skills into schools, and schools who are looking for help to get help as well. And they're basically trying to encourage knitting in school. So I thought, well, if I link up with them, they'll help me meet other people who are knitting. They'll help me get to schools who are knitting. And we can try and see if there's a link between this and programming. So this is the audience participation time. OK. Hopefully, you've got a piece of wool. And we're going to follow this video of finger knitting. OK. So we'll see how it is. As you're doing it, thinking about um, not the annoying music, but thinking about, is this uh, where you're assessing as you're going along, are you reflecting on it? Are you asking the person next to you, what was that, what, how did you do that? So we're going to have a go at this. So you need one piece of wool each, and away we go.
feeling either frustrated, you might be feeling quite pleased with how it's going. At the minute, you might just be thinking, well, I can't actually make out if I've done it right yet. And that's one of the things I found with it is, well, actually, when you're trying to knit, when you've done quite a bit, it starts to then form a shape you recognize. But initially, it just looks like a mess of loops and things in there. OK. And that's the same. I thought, well, that's with, like, with programming. When I've tried to program, sometimes it's been a right mess. But actually, as time's gone on, as it's developed, I think, well, actually, now it makes more sense. And um, I was talking just before um, with, with Ross from Google, and he was talking about doing his bow tie, and he watched the video, and actually needed to watch two different videos, two different angles to see how to do it. So this is just one example there. So we shall move on, because we, uh, we're short of time. So talking with the children about knitting, here's an example of a young girl I was working with, and she was knitting, and she got stuck. And I said, well, I'll try and help you out here. So I tried to help her out. And the lady who was working in school, she was taught by her, her grandmother how to knit. She goes, the best way of knitting, actually, is to sit down, and then like, my grandmother used to sort of sit behind me like this and knit like that. And I could see that from the first person's perspective. But I said, I'm not going to go into schools and say, can I borrow some children, please? And I'm going to sit behind them and knit, you see. So I thought I wouldn't be allowed in again. But that's basically trying to think about from the person's perspective. And again, that made me think more about programming too. So the hypothesis that I came up with, or the number of hypotheses, hypotheses that we came up with, was that firstly, the social side of the thing, the chatting that went on around it was pretty good. The turn taking, things like that. The technology could be a way of actually capturing skills. My uncle Norman is, uh, is quite old now. He's going to go. The stories he's told me, the things like that are going to go. If we could capture those, it would be a useful tool. Um, the technology could help us learn to knit. So watching the YouTube videos, that type of videos, which are professionally made, ones the kids have made, could be useful. And then about similarities between knitting and programming. There's some in there. And then also we could capture them young. Then that would help us as we went on. So trying to make the analogy, really, is things like the user experience. Here's Michael Fish in his jumper. You think about it, you don't knit for no purpose. You don't think, I'm going to knit now just any shape for the sake of it. You knit with somebody in mind. People knit when there's a new baby. They knit because there's something or a person in mind. So you're thinking about the user. What's their user experience? So for Michael Fish, it was to have a, a weather jumper. You're following a series of instructions. So for example, like in programming, you can see there's the, uh, the instructions in a row. When you make a mistake, you need to go back and solve it. You need to debug it. Things like syntax, what words and special terms do we use within knitting and programming? Well, in knitting, there's things like knit, purl. You know, if you ever mentioned knitting, people always knit one, purl one. They know that as a language, it's sort of a common syntax in there. Different variables are in there. So how many times do you need to do it? So for example, um, you're going to cast on for 17 stitches. So depending on what size of uh, piece or jumper you want, it depends on how many times you cast on, those different variables. Expressions, so for example, what you do with those variables. So for example, here in, in a uh, pattern, there is, think for example, knit, increase one, knit to last two stitches, increase, knit seven stitches. So it's things to do with the, the different variables. Think about arrays. Well, I suppose you could think about different patterns. This is actually a knitting pattern. And can you see how the different squiggles and things in there? So as Jonathan mentioned at the start, different knitting patterns, you can think of them as arrays in there, storing that information. Input and output, you're putting in information in terms of the stitches, you're getting an output, I guess, of the actual you know, garment or whatever at the end. And things like libraries, what libraries do you use in there? Well, you know how to do, for example, a knit, a knit stitch, you know how to do a, a, um, a purl, you know how to do a stocking stitch, you're putting them together. These sort of libraries of information which are used. And subroutines in there as well. So the idea of that, there's a subroutine for like a heel of a, a part of clothing or whatever. 
And basically loops in general, you keep knitting until you get to the desired end and then you start again and repeat it. So looking on Crowdvine yesterday, um, we have a, a comment here from Susanna. Unfortunately, Susanna couldn't be here in the session, but I'm going to meet up with her at lunchtime. She said, the group might be interested in NITML. And so I looked at NITML, and this is a language which is the idea, it's like a programming language linking to patterns. So if you look at the sort of information there, you can see there's cast on 24. You can see row knit to end, row pearl to end. And it sort of makes sense. It's sort of linked between the knitting and the programming to me anyway. So next, to infinity and beyond. Excuse the puns, as ever. What next? Well, what we're thinking about is the idea of this whole thing of computational thinking. How can you get a problem, break it down, and solve it? And uh, on, the, on the Google website, there's some very good uh, resources about computational thinking, which have been useful to introduce it to the children. Back to our hypotheses. I've got to still have these hypotheses. I think there's something in it. I think the more people I chat to, they can say, yeah, I can sort of see the links between it. The problem I have at the minute is actually finding people who are interested in knitting and people who are interested in programming. Because at the minute, they seem to be quite disparate groups. But I think there is a link there. And I think there's, as I work with the, the groups, uh, with the craft club and also with the groups in the northeast of England, as we see the children trying to do the knitting, we're going to try and see if we can make those links between the two more explicit, see if they can turn, see the links and where it's going forwards. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for knitting. Thank you.